Welcome to Upstate and Litigate. I'm Derek Spada. We're back here for another episode in Season 2. Good morning. I'm Maureen Keegan, attorney at Bosch & Keegan, here to chat about an interesting conversation, insurance companies. It's CLI Bosch. Good morning. And I'm glad we're here to talk about insurance because the lack of insurance makes me sad. <laughs> so our topic for today is our love-hate relationship with insurance companies. Sometimes we love them, like when they settle a case and pay us, and almost every other time we hate them. There's, there's various reasons why we hate them. Go ahead and <laughs> Tell the audience why we hate insurance companies. Well, you know, in New York State, you do have to have certain types of insurance. You have to have car insurance if you have that, uh, other types of insurance like workers' compensation if you have a business and things like that. But insurance companies are in the business to make money, and they make money by not paying claims. And that's where we come in. I always say that, you know, if insurance companies were fair to their uh, constituents and to the people who pay them, we wouldn't be in business. What do you think, Eli? And we've been in business for, well, myself for 48 years. And the reason is that the insurance companies, while you think they're my insurance company, uh, they're propaganda, or you would call it advertising, makes it look like they're there to help you. They're really there to help themselves. They're businesses. They're run to make a profit. They're not run to make like a public service to help. And um, they often interpret their policies in favor of themselves, almost uniformly, because if they don't have to pay, they get to keep the money. And lawyers like Bosch and Keegan, like Derek, Maureen, and myself are there to hopefully keep them honest, to make them do what the consumers have paid money for, respond to claims and pay them fairly. We can get into some bad faith. That's really a bad faith issue a little bit later on. Why don't we explain why we need insurance, Derek? Sure. Well, it seems like everyone pays insurance, you know, monthly or biannually, annually for their cars. And premiums. Uh, and premiums. You know, they pay for their, their homes. They pay other types of insurance, health insurance, uh, renter's insurance, dental insurance, life insurance. You just keep on paying these bills for insurance based on, on your needs. And then when it comes time to make a claim, there's hurdles. There's always hurdles with every claim, it feels feels like. But despite all of that, we still need insurance because let me ask you a quick Quick question. What's the worst news you can hear on, on any case? Ugh, they don't no have insurance. insurance. Right. <laughs> well, there's no insurance. The that's insurance always bad insurance company disclaimed Ugh. for some reason, which isn't always the end either. Sometimes right. they disclaim wrongly. That's another thing, right. reason why you might need an attorney. So as, as difficult as it is to deal with insurance claims, it's better than having no insurance. And you know, to, to have insurance, well, first of all, I'd say that, that you need it whether or not you have any assets just because it's, it's the right thing to do. So if someone is injured, um, you should have insurance so that your insurance company deals with their claim and pays them what's fair. And if you have assets, you need to protect your assets. And the way to do that is to have enough insurance so that if there is a claim made against you, you're, you're financially safe. That's the, the whole concept here. It doesn't always work that way, but that's the idea behind it. Yeah, and there's, there's so many different types of insurance that Derek makes reference to liability insurance, but you have health insurance. It, you know, you're not sick all the time. You're sick very infrequently, but when you are sick, it could be catastrophic expenses. So what you do is you pay your premium every month over many, many years, and then at some time in your life, often there's going to be a big expense, and the insurance is supposed to be there at that time. Uh, they were your really good friend while you're paying your premium, but sometimes they're not so friendly when it comes time to pay. And uh, that's the nature of insurance. And it's not just health insurance. You have mortgage insurance. You have property insurance in case there's a storm. Auto insurance. Most people Auto, are familiar the with that. Many insurances are mandatory. And um, um, meanwhile, um, they're controlled to a certain extent and regulated, but the regulators generally come out of the industry. So it's, it's, it's our job as lawyers for the consumers to help the consumer, not to help the insurance industry. And, um, and, and a lot of times uh, the insurance industry owns the umpire. And so we have to keep them honest. Are we going back to the Yankees again? Well, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> owns the umpire. Okay. Um, so insurance companies really become the, your enemy, not only in their paperwork about making a claim or getting someone on the phone. Um, I think you know now that you can do everything electronically, it's a little easier. But they just evaluate it improperly. You know, they just tell you, even though your back hurts or your neck hurts or you're having trouble lifting things from a car crash or whatever, you're okay. You can still go ahead and do things. Just don't. Just keep going. Just keep going. And they just continuously miss 
represent how you are doing in a, in a situation when you get hurt or how people are feeling after it. And, and it's our job to try to get people to understand it's not you. You know, you, you are legitimately, if you are legitimately hurt, please let us know. Please get the attention. Don't ignore it because in six or nine months, you have lost the opportunity to make a valid claim from a car case because you ignored your problems, you ignored your pain, you worked through it all, and now you're you're in an uphill battle. You're in a room by yourself because you've met. You you cannot now you now you cannot meet the New York State requirement to have a litigation or to have a serious injury. It's very frustrating to us. The most legitimate people come into us. It's oftentimes too late, and that's why we always tell people, just contact us, call us, consult with us. We'll give you some advice. It's not going to cost you anything. Even if you don't have a case or you do have a case, in the next five to ten years, you'll be sending other people to our office. We'll be taking care of other people. That's really what we do. We take care of people when a disaster or a catastrophe happens, or even a, a minor car crash can cause serious problems for people. We've seen that mm -hmm. through the years. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really not just any, a car accident. It could be any type of claim. When you submit the claim, the first thing the insurance company does is looks to see if there's coverage. If they can tell you you're not covered, they can just walk away and do absolutely nothing. And you don't really even know what the basis of the questions are, why they're being asked, and you just think, oh, I'm telling the truth. But what you often be, are being done is being walked down a path to no coverage. And while it's the same facts and the same situation, how you characterize and how you respond can be the total 100% difference between coverage or not. And for like even like property Legitimate damage, claims, like, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a, uh, a storm and uh, your, gu your gutters, well, your gutters get clogged and water backs up and you get sustained damage. And you say, oh, yeah, it was clogged gutters. Now, Clock gutters are almost always excluded, okay? However, if it's windborne and, and they blew the leaves in there and they blew the water in, wind damage is covered. So how you answer those simple questions about what happened could be fatal. It and the, could uh, destroy uh, your ability uh, to have a claim, and what they do is disclaim, and it isn't like you can argue with them. They just take your words and use them against you. When you come to us, then we as skilled lawyers have to dig out of the hole and get back onto a level playing field and then fight over the value of the claim or the, uh, or the nature and extent of the uh, damage, and it's just not like you think. But meanwhile, you think, oh, it was my insurance company. They, they like me. I've been good yeah, to them. I oh. paid my premium. I haven't made a claim in 25 years. They're going to take good care of me. I like them. I like my person who I bought it from. That is not the reality. What Eli is talking about happens all the time. They come into us with a recorded statement that the insurance company sends us and then says to us, now you go ahead and disprove what your client has told us. We have it recorded. Here it is. It becomes very, very difficult. Yeah, and the way that adjusters look at claims is that they look at it from, a, from the view of trying to deny it through any means possible. So either that's your job. So yeah, that, that that's, that is their that's job. Their job. Right. They so get to not, keep the money. Yeah. How are they going to get a raise? They're not your friend is my they're point. They're not going to be able to get <laughs> that bonus at the end of the year. Them. Yeah, right. You, you, you can't trust them. They and don't get bonuses their, for right. paying additional monies out on claims. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how it works. Yeah. No matter how legit. Yeah. yeah. And, and then uh, it's, it's our job. It happens to, every uh, day. Like a, yesterday was an example that I had somebody on an injury situation and actually have to be a nurse and tried to work through her, her problems after the accident. And then uh, things got continuously, progressively worse. And then she just goes to ready care. And then, you know, it's easier for the, and there's multiple layers and different types of insurance that exist. And who gets to pay is a question also. So in terms of a, an injury in an automobile accident, no fault. The auto insurer pays. But they paid a very, very r low rate, the workers' compensation rate. Uh, your regular medical insurance often would pay at a higher rate. And so the person in the medical office is very content to bill it to your regular medical insurance because they get paid more. And plus, when it's Medicare, they can just do it electronically. And with no fault, there's form after form after form. Auto insurance, they deny, push back. It's hard. It's just a lot of work. Um, so later on, in terms of getting coverage for lost wages, for it being auto-related, for getting um, having a case for the nature and extent of your injury against the responsible party, it all becomes different and more difficult because of the way things are characterized at the beginning. And it's just the nature of what we do is, you know, the lawyers were wordsmiths. 
and the insurance policy is a contract and it's in in wording and the words sometimes have different meaning than consumers that uh, that lay people think they mean uh, but we as lawyers recognize that sometimes these are red flags and we can help you through the process to make sure that you're treated fairly and there's, there's also cases that don't really have necessarily a high value, but insurance companies spare no expense to defend them. They spend more to defend the claim than the claim could ever be worth. Yeah. You know, it makes it's, me think of that, that one no-fault case where, <laughs> you know, the never-ending case. It, well, actually, I've, I've had two. I've had, <laughs> did I've, end I've, well. Had, yeah, okay. I've, had, I've had two that, that were never-ending, but, yeah, one went to the appellate division twice. Seven and, years. And it was a seven-year case. I think there were maybe 11 or 13 motions, by the, all by the defense, all by the insurance company's lawyers. That I, so I beat every one of those motions, two went up on appeal. I won the appeal, and it was passed around, I think, to three or four different defense firms along this process. And eventually, they paid. It was, I think it was seven years, seven years. Yeah. And then there's yeah. the, and it was the a totally one. legitimate claim. They yeah. just didn't oh, yeah. want to pay no it. They to just that. took a, a, you know, they put a B in their bonnet. They were going to fight you every step of the way. Yeah. And a lot of firms give up. I don't want to take an appeal on a no-fault case. That's a stupid thing to do. Yeah. But the persistence paid off. And yeah. now Geico is afraid of Derek and the appellate division, that's for sure. There was the other case, too, with the lost wages. <laughs> the guy who worked at the auto parts distributor. <laughs> that was a great story. And that, I mean, they... He had he had a job lined up, our client, just before the accident happened, but the job was in writing. So it was like guaranteed income once he started working, but couldn't work due to his injuries. And so we sued the insurance company and it went through all the whole process of litigation. Then they made a summary judgment motion to have the case dismissed, which I beat. Then they appealed, went to the appellate division, but the insurance company won at the appellate division and the case got dismissed. But there were two dissents. So I was able to appeal from the appellate division to the highest court in New York State. So I went to the <laughs> the, the, the court of appeals. And I, no fault. On, on a no-fault claim, and then I won there on all the claims except one that wasn't decided. So then the so the case was sent back to the appellate division where that last claim was decided in my favor, and then it went back to the trial court here in Kingston, and the insurance company still wouldn't offer a dime on the case. So I had to go to trial. I went to trial, and I won, and the jury gave me every cent that I asked for except $7. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how, how the math worked out, but they, they cut me down $7. But anyway, it still worked out really well. But in the big picture, I know the insurance company spent more on this defense than the They had too many. They the had like five worth. firms involved. Yeah. They had the appellate firm. They had the guy yeah. who's tried the case against you. And, yeah. Yeah. And in the middle of that was Irene, the hurricane. Oh, yeah. Which was his excuse. There was, it was, they used it as an excuse. Oh, it was a hurricane. He was never going to work there because the business failed afterwards. And it didn't yeah. matter. We were able to show... That he was going to get hired, he was going to get paid, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's that's what we're saying is persistence overcomes resistance. Yeah, it's not, it's it's, not easy. You got to you gotta it, get the good advice, the right information. And, and, and on the street or in business, people would think we're crazy to take these cases. <laughs> Why would you do it? But what you, we do is we just focus on the client, focus on the consumer. And if the insurance company's wrong... We are not going to take no for an answer. And what happens oftentimes, sometimes it's really simple. The, the insurance adjuster at the beginning is just wrong, but that they won't admit their mistake. They get locked in layer after layer. They just keep fighting, fighting, fighting. And, and, and we think it's you know white and black. It's like clear as a, a bell. But they can use the legal process to delay it. Meanwhile, the people aren't paid. They're out of work. They have no money. They'll take, you know, they have to go on with their life and forget about it. Force but, them back into work in, in yeah, an injured yeah, position yeah. just then, because they don't have yeah, money. And to then pay. they get fired from the new job because they're disabled and can't work up to speed. And right. then the, the insurance company takes the position well, you, you know, you got another job and you were working so you weren't disabled. Right. And then it's it just, it's, it's a, a really slippery slope, a, a, a momentous ball rolling down the hill, and we're there to stop it or push, to push Sisyphus, up the slope. Sisyphus pushing that yeah. rock up the hill. But we yeah. should also tell people about the idea that, you know, people go, oh, I don't want to get involved with that. I don't want to, you know, sue my friend, my neighbor, oh. my cousin. You know, yeah. who yeah. wants to take this one? This is an easy, <laughs> this is a big softball. It's an easy one. Yeah, but there's always, well, I should say, always essentially insurance. And if you do sue your friend or relative, the money is coming from their insurance company, not from them. And if they're truly your friend or someone who cares about you, they'll be happy to see you get money from the insurance company if you're entitled to it. 
Right. Yeah, I mean, really, if your next door neighbor who you really like backs up into your car and crashes your fender, you'll just pay it out of your pocket. You wouldn't want their insurance company to pay because it's your friend's car, right? No, they paid the premium. It isn't like the insurance company is going to give them a rebate and send, a bonus. Send, send back money because your neighbors won't make claims against you. It's And what happens is people, it's very basic psychology. Uh, every, nobody likes to admit a mistake, me, me included. And, you know, nobody I does. And so, so really some, but like these are unintentional that. acts, mistakes, and um, you have insurance for it. And what people think is, is that, oh, I'm going to be sued, or I'm going to have to sue my next door neighbor or relative or friend. And it's really an insurance company. And what happens is, is people who are the ones who made a mistake caused an accident or contributed to it, um, feel feel bad, but it's not their problem. Don't make it your problem. You made a mistake. What you did was you bought insurance, and that's what insurance you is. It's there premiums. just yeah. as much for your friends and family, certainly, than it is for strangers. And uh, the insurance company has have, uh, used propaganda. If you look through old magazines back to 1915, 1920, and you'll see these ads, and they're always making... Uh, insurance claim immoral. There's this morality about suing, that it's immoral to sue, when really we're a, a, a country of laws and that a, a suit is brought because you're justified in using the law and having the law determine things. But insurance companies have given this propaganda out for decades, even more than a century, um, so that the common perception to most people is that it's immoral and bad to sue. Oh, I'm not a sewer. I can't sue. But what happens is you have to sue oftentimes because the insurance company is going to manipulate the situation and they're going to force you to sue. And they know that a high percentage of people are going to think it's immoral and won't sue, even though it's, it's not it's not their problem. It's look, the look insurance they, company's look problem. Look at how they control how it looks to the jury. Exactly. The jury is never told that there is insurance or there's no insurance. And there's actually an instruction to the jury that you're not to consider insurance. But the entire time the jury is sitting there thinking, why don't these people just settle this case? This woman's obviously hurt. They must. Then they start thinking to themselves, oh, maybe she doesn't have insurance. That happened to my cousin once. So now I shouldn't you know, make an award. The insurance company constantly makes it an uphill battle for a, uh, an injury person to get compensated they don't allow you to put the insurance company on the on the on the uh, summons and complaint we have to put the individual who made that rule up if we had state farm and progressive and travelers and new york central mutual and all these other insurance companies but not as in, geico because everybody like loves the lizard, <laughs> the lizard okay and he's got a really nice accent <laughs> well uh, that's another thing like these insurance companies it's they, cute they yeah. use they use animated a animals that are very cute and very smart and people remember it it's a good jingle good good yeah. advertising good for you geico but I, you know the reality is they are not there to be yeah. your friend they don't they don't want to help you what, what changes have you seen in the insurance landscape throughout your career? Has, you know, have they gotten more difficult, easier, or about the same? It's really it's it's typical America. It's been um, a larger consolidation of the insurance industry. It's been mass marketing uh, of the insurance industry. It used to be people would have their own agent. And the agent would have some rapport with a number of different insurance companies. True. And your agent, because you bought through your local agent, would be your advocate. But what's happened is, to a large extent, mass marketing, progressive, Geico, oh, farmers, they're out there all the time. And they get people to pay them directly. And there's no interpersonal contact with your own insurance, quote, agent. or right. and the, It's your agent, not the insurance company's agent. Right. So that's one of the dynamics that I see. Um, the other is, is that um, um, they are, how would I say, they're more fearful now of jurors and, and trials than ever. The power, the power the of the jury. The, the power of yeah. the jury, not that there's more trials, but there's more risk. And, 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 and the insurance companies are all about risk. And they sure. want to keep things within limits. And they don't mind paying. In fact, they like to pay. Because if they pay and have claims, if they don't have claims, nobody has to buy insurance. They, you know, they have to reduce their rates. The love-hate I mean, relationship lose money. between insurance right. you know, and companies and, and lawyers. Right. And, and lawyers, on the other hand, 
uh, bring cases to help people and also to make uh, modifications in products. Seat belts are the result of lawyers. The safety, all these safety. All the lawnmowers the, the, the that cut, cut, cut off. Cut that's because there's all, been litigation. I've to seen show. it. I've been almost that's 50 kind of annoying, years. Though. I don't like that cut off on my mower. It's annoying. No, it's well, <laughs> as long as your fingers are all intact or the snow blowers, all those things yeah. are a result of litigation. The uh, you know engineers. And it's not just the engineers. That did. It was the lawyers who got involved with it and figured out a way to say to the company, why would you make this? Forty dollars more expense, you know, cheaper than making it safer for the rest of the world to not lose all their fingers. That's like such a devastating yeah. injury. Yeah. Or, Catastrophic, or, no, it, co- right? And, and, Catastrophic. And, and, and it's it's kind of interesting um, phenomena uh, about reinsurance that people don't realize that insurance companies buy insurance for large claims, and so they take the risk and spread it among a number of different insurers. They pool their money for catastrophic events. And uh, what I find interesting is when there's like a hurricane, like we've seen devastation by hurricane, they fight the claims, but there's still billions of dollars paid out. And you would think that the stocks, because insurance companies are almost always stock companies. They are in it to make the money. And the only way you can beat an insurance company, it's really simple, is to join them and buy their stock because they are the casino. So you think... Wow, there's hurricanes, there's devastation or fires. Um, this is going to really hurt the insurance industry. It doesn't hurt them. It helps them because they already have reserves put away in these reinsure pools to pay for that current loss. But what they get is they get to increase their premiums next year by 15 to 20 percent. Because so people know that those for, devastations happen yeah, and they expect the increased premium and they don't fight about it. No, because there's, there's no been these fires. There's higher risk. Right. And so, but that's insurance. And do we need it? Yeah. And I always think that, you know, most people, I mean, 50 percent of the people have sent more money and paid more money insurance premiums than they put in their savings account. But if they put money in a savings account, they get to draw it out because it's their money. When you send it to an insurance company, it's gone forever. It is their money. It goes to their shareholders. It goes to those big, beautiful buildings they have. It goes to those <laughs> private jets they fly around in, and it gets it gets to pay those employees who are really smart and can deny your claim. And they, when they go to trial, they have they get to pay the lawyers. They get to pay doctors who are experts, who are very um, articulate and convincing in order to save the insurance company money. And that's really what it is. And we're on the other side. We're on the side of consumers. We're there to prevent unfairness. And, and you know, insurance companies do have a lot of little tricks up their sleeve. And, I, and I'm not saying they're even tricks. It's sort of they'll, they'll claim evening the playing field. But the doctors they pick to examine you to make a determination if they should make a claim, they call them independent medical exams. I call them defense medical exams. And they are paid for by the insurance company. And if you ever cross-examine them, as we all have, they usually have about 60, somewhere between 20 and 60 people coming in and out of their office at a rapid rate. They give it a very short shrift. You're like, mm-hmm. okay, you're okay. Good, good, good. You're good, to, you're good to go. You can move up. You can. Does your mouth work? You can go to work. Okay, don't worry. And, and I understand it's not their job to find an injury, but they are so cursory and they're so unfair. People get so frustrated because all these good people who paid their premium think they're telling the truth. I'm, I'm hurt. I need. I don't even want to be hurt, but I, this is happening. And they go to these defense medical exams that immediately say, get back to work. You're not going to get your no-fault lost wages. You're not going to get your medical bills paid. It has this devastating consequence on these poor people's lives. But Ms. Keegan, life. they're doctors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, well, they how could have... they say that? You, and, and what they're... they are is yeah. gate, oftentimes on medical claims, they're gatekeepers. They'll prevent you from having an operation or having a treatment you need. And they know the law almost better than we do because I've had, you know, one guy who's been doing it for 50 years and he's very good looking, wears a nice tie and a white jacket and he looks right in the camera and says, you know, there's nothing wrong with him, tells the jury there's nothing wrong with him. And I finally got him on cross-examination to admit maybe she was out. She was she was unable to work for 90 out of 180 days so he could have a case and get paid by the jury. And that doctor has also made millions over, over his career Absolutely. doing these insurance exams. I yeah, think they, I, literally in my last millions. trial, I think it totaled up almost, uh, I think it was uh, over $10 million yeah. in testimony. <laughs> it's, I call it the best part-time job, the best job in America. A doctor can work, a retired, semi-retired doctor who claims to still be practicing can uh, work one day a week, do 30 exams, get 
three to five hundred dollars a pop, then testify ten times during the year, and uh, not get cross examined, and make make close to a million dollars yeah. or more. And in other words, make two to three times what the president of the United States is paid for working one day a week and doesn't even really need an office. Can and just go to the chiropractor's office and have the people come in. And he doesn't need uh, liability insurance, which otherwise doctors complain to everybody else about why do I have to pay this high premium because I have liability insurance because he can't get sued for doing a bad job on an IMA. The insurance company wants him to do a bad job on the IMA. And, so and, it's and very that, unfair. That's on, on the liability side. But on your own side, and it could be health insurance, it could be no-fault benefits, they're gatekeepers. When they deny your claim, the insurance company saves money. And believe me, the doctor who is employed by the insurance company knows where the business is and which side the bread is buttered on. And so they deny the claims, and it's a difference of opinion, and it can take months or years if you can get some lawyer to litigate for you to try and get coverage while you're suffering. And uh, it is a cruel world out there. Um, there. There's some differences from the insurance companies, but not much. And, um, uh, and we're there to try to keep things fair. Let's talk about yeah. the grieving, the, the, uh, the law that's still pending. That the Grieving hasn't Families been, Act. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're, uh, yeah we're, I guess we're still waiting for the governor to sign it. I think it's the third time on her desk. And it's, you know, it was agreed to by both parties. It's bi- bipartisan. Um, Almost unanimously. Yeah, yeah. So the the reason why this law is so bad is it was originally passed in 1861, and it was like before or during the Civil War. So when we, the wrongful death statute in New York State is extremely, extremely unfair, and until you have a client who has lost a child, and you know has the most outrageous fact pattern you can ever imagine, a UPS truck running over their child in their own driveway not entitled to get any compensation for pain and suffering or any of the normal things that happen. And the courts continuously uphold this law. It's so unfair. And the governor has insisted that she needed a few modifications the first time it was on her desk. They were modified. It was sent back to the legislature. She insists on not even vetoing it because the legislature would override her veto. It's very unfair. If you get an opportunity to speak to your legislatures about that, that is a, a real crime in New York. Yeah, because yeah. New York State does not recognize grief or, or uh, psychological loss. So if a child dies, it's only, or an elderly person dies, your damages for wrongful death are limited to, it's called pecuniary loss, but it's really financial loss. So a child isn't supporting a parent, so there's no financial loss. An elderly parent isn't supporting their children or grandchildren, so there's no financial loss. In other words, there's no value to children and no value to seniors under the wrongful death statute in New York. And it's simply not fair. And um, it needs to be reformed. It's archaic. We are in the small minority of states that have such a statute. Almost every other state recognizes grief and psychological loss that families suffer from the loss of a relative who is wrongfully killed. It's not just anybody. You have to show that it was wrongful and that there is actual and real damages to the family. And uh, even now, if you can do that, you can't recover anything. Um, You get the funeral bill for a child. You get the funeral bill for a, for a senior, and that's it. And it's unfair. And the only the only industry that benefits is the insurance industry. It's and people and are very f- aware of it in New York State. Very aware what of it. What were you going to yeah. say, Derek? Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's just long overdue to have this passed. We're just really behind the times, and to live in a state where there's no value on a life other than the financial component is uh, is just wrong. You know, it's just yeah. not not fair, not just. There's nothing right about it, and uh, you know, it's time for the governor to sign that bill. Yeah, and and uh, under 9/11, people lost their life uh, in that horrible terrorist attack. Federal legislation had a different definition. They looked at one by one who was dependent upon the person. Here in New York, if you're not married, uh, there's no pecuniary loss. You don't have a wrongful death case, even though you lived with the person for 20 or 30 years, even though the child has been supported for 10 years by by what is maybe not a blood relative, but, but for all intents and purposes, their parent, no compensation. But the federal government looked at the Social Security standard, which would, uh, Social Security, you could be a, quote, widow or widower, even though you weren't married when you've been living together. Likewise, for a child has been supported. And those are 
concepts of fairness. There, uh, I believe in marriage, but some people don't. But the people who don't believe in marriage, their relationship should be honored and should be recognized in the law for what it is. And, and the New York State statute does not do that. And it's about time that it does. Archaic. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so to, to wrap it up for today, yeah. you know, insurance companies are difficult. Sometimes we hate them, and sometimes we love them. But uh, we all need insurance. And uh, if you have any issues with an insurance company, you know, feel free to call us. We can certainly guide you through it and help you out. I just think the idea that you have to consult with an attorney, even if even if you're the one being sued or whatever, <clears throat> there's all these technical things you have to learn a little bit about. If it's all foreign to you, don't think that just because, you know, your child got bit by your neighbor's dog, there's nothing that should be done or whatever happened. You know, just call us, get a consult. We're not going to charge you money for the initial consult. We'll be fair. We'll be frank and you might not like what we're going to tell you but we'll tell you what we think is accurate and we'd like you to call us right away at the beginning before an insurance company investigator adjuster puts words in your mouth it's very important to call us first and then we can give you some guidance because if you don't know where you're headed i don't care how many maps you have you're never going to get there (laughs) so call us first thank you thanks for watching and you can like and follow us on the podcast uh on the icons below and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time here at Upstate and Litigate.